Hello, women made in the image of God. So today we're back with another Bible in a year video and today we get to read Exodus 21 to 23 and Mark 1 um, verse 1 through 28. So yeah, we get to start a new book today. Woo! Okay, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you are so perfect in all of your ways. Oh God, thank you for your great mercy and love, for your holiness and your justice and just how absolutely like holy you are, how other you are, how perfect you are, um, how set apart you are, God, how um, just distinctly beautiful um, you are, oh God. Um, please teach us your ways today as we read. Please, would you under open our minds to understand your scriptures? Would you grant us wisdom? Please, God, we ask and we beg that you would give us wisdom, your wisdom, Lord, and that you would continue to um, just wash away all, all things that are wrong and replace them with your beautiful truth, Lord, that our lives would be built on your truth and that you would continue to save us from the deceiver, um, from the evil one that seeks to um, fill our minds with lies. Lord, would you blot those things out as we read together today and would you replace those lies with your truth, truth about who you are, God, your absolute beauty. Would you overwhelm us with just getting to know you better that we could be with you lord as we read together that we could um see your loveliness and that um we would just get to enjoy you lord um in this time together in jesus name amen all right so let's read our catechism question for today so uh question 18 of keech's catechism um uh, in other words, the Baptist Catechism. What was the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created? Answer. The, the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created was their eating the forbidden fruit. I'm going to read that one more time. Uh, what was the sin that our first parents fell from the estate they were created? It, in which they were created the sin sorry i'm trying to like make it more readable for my brain but i'm trying not to change the content at all of what's being said just i don't really use whereby in my lang language today because i'm a dumb american <laughs> sorry not adding anyone just just being honest uh with where our public school system is at um i had the blessing of uh, like two years in private school though like in my um, high school years but that's besides the point um let's just read it as it was and we'll just comprehend it that way it's fine it's not that complicated what was the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created the sin whereby our first parents fell from the estate wherein they were created was their eating the forbidden fruit all right, Genesis 3, 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Uh, and then Genesis three twelve. The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree and I ate. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. I'm going to read that in a different translation because I think other translations are better than this one. So let's go to, where are you at, NASB. There it is. Yeah, I'm going to read it in this translation. Um, 
To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children, yet you, your desire will be for your husband, but, and he will rule over you. Okay. Uh, and then Genesis three seventeen, And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat it, eat of it all the days of your life. So yeah, our we need Christ <laughs> because yeah. I actually even want to go to Genesis three nineteen, even though that has not not what has nothing to do with uh the uh particular verse or particular um not verse uh, particular uh question and answer. But anyways, um, where is it? Genesis 3. Yeah, here we go. Genesis 3.15. Um, the Proto-Evangelion, I think it's called. Um, first gospel. In other words, God says to them, he says, I and I will put enmity between you and the woman, or he says to um the serpent and i will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel so this is prophecy that is fulfilled in christ so thanks be to god for his the good news of jesus christ our need for christ shown here and um yeah jesus is the way of salvation thank god all right, well, let's read the word together. Um, so pull out your Bibles and let us read Leviticus 21 to 23 and Mark 1, verse 1 through 28. Leviticus 21. And the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, No one shall make himself unclean for the dead among his people except for his closest relatives, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, mother, or his virgin sister, who is near to him because she has had no husband. For her he may make himself unclean. He shall not make himself unclean as a husband among his people, and so profane himself. They shall not make ball patches on their heads, nor shave off the edges of their beards, nor make any cuts on their body. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God. For they offer the Lord's food offerings, the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. They shall not marry a prostitute or a woman who has been defiled. Neither shall they marry a woman divorced from her husband. For the priest is holy to his God. You shall sanctify him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. And the daughter of any priest, if she profanes herself by whoring, profanes her father she shall be burned with fire. The priest who is chief among his brothers, on whose head the anointing oil is poured, and who has been consecrated to wear the garments, shall not let the hair of his head hang loose, nor tear his clothes. He shall not go into any dead bodies, nor make himself unclean, even for his father or for his mother. He shall not go out of the sanctuary, lest he profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is on him. I am the Lord. And he shall take a wife in her virginity, a widow, or a divorced woman, or a woman who has been defiled, or a prostitute. These he shall not marry, but he shall take as his wife a virgin of his own people, that he may not profane his offspring among his people. For I am the Lord who sanctifies him. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, None of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. For no one who has a blemish shall draw near, a man blind or lame, or one who has a mutilated face or a limb too long, or a man who has an injured foot or an injured hand, or a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man with a defect in his sight or an itching disease, or scabs or crushed testicles. No man of the offspring of Aaron the priest who has a blemish shall come near to offer the Lord's food offerings. Since he has a blemish, he shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both of the most holy and of the holy things, but he shall not go through the veil or approach the altar because he has a blemish, that he may not profane my sanctuaries, for I am the Lord who sanctifies them. 
So Moses spoke to Aaron and to his sons and to all the people of Israel. Okay. Leviticus. Pausing there. Um, excuse me, sorry. Uh, I for a second I had I had forgot the context of this passage. So um, I think this is important. It says, and the Lord said to Moses, speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them. So the context of this is that he's speaking to the priests. Um, to the priests. Um, so I just felt like that was important to point out because I don't know why, but I did not, wasn't paying attention enough for some reason. But anyways, I'm going to read uh, the notes for this chapter because they're so brief anyways. I just read all of them. Um, ceremonial clean... Uh, so 21 verses 1 to 24. Ceremonial unclean... Ceremonial... <laughs> try it one more time. Ceremonial cleanliness regulations specific to the priests are recorded. Recorded. These deal with the with priests in general. The high priest... Uh, verses 10 through 15 and priests suffering from defects verses 16 to 24 all priests who serve within the tabernacle have to show god's holiness in their character in their character and in their bodies because their duties bring them closer to god it is essential that they be holy holiness in restored man ultimately involves his perfection and health fullness of life, freedom from mortality, and decay. So priests with certain handicaps are forbidden to offer sacrifice. Wholeness is closely associated with holiness, but handicapped priests still still enjoy a full share of priestly provisions. Yeah, that, that was important to note. And again, it's that, like, association with death and life. Um the whole like that principle that we read earlier on it's not to be offensive it's to show that god is life and um yeah and it also just exposes our need for christ because this world is so broken down to the last detail you know um and ultimately there will be no more pain no more suffering uh no more many of these you know, it's just I mean, everything will be perfect in the new heaven and earth. We'll have new resurrection bodies, and so uh, there will be no blemishes. Uh, but even while we're here, you know, the Lord still provides for people, um, no matter what, you know. Um, in many ways, so according to his will. Um but yeah, let's read this next note. Uh, 21 1. Holiness. As a key attribute of God, who is himself life and death, are incompatible. Therefore, priests may not mourn for any save, any save their closest relatives. Except for his closest relatives. Okay. Um. Mourning customs involving disfigurement of the body were also banned, for priests as holy men had to have whole bodies. Uh, Deuteronomy 14, 1 note. Yeah. Um, uh, 21, 10 through 12. The high priest who has the privilege of entering into God's immediate presence is obliged to avoid all contact with death. 10, 6, 10, 7. I'm actually really interested to see what notes there are on this section before we move on. Um, Leviticus 21. Yeah, I was, I'm going to read this note because this was like, I don't know, the language was confusing for me, so I'm going to read this note. For a lay person, coming into contact with the, the dead, as in attending a funeral, brings about defilement, though it is allowed. Um, Numbers 19 is, a, is the example. But ordinary priests... Sorry. Um, 
but ordinary priests for high priests see note on leviticus 21 yeah we which was what we just read but it was from a different study bible but anyways uh, but ordinary priests are prohibited from coming into contact with the dead except in the case of their closest relatives his virgin sister the last or the assumption is that once she marries she is not regarded as one of his closest relatives but comes under the care of her husband and his clan oh okay that was a really helpful note because i was like what's the difference um that makes a sense okay cool uh holiness requires separation from death deaths with sh sh death symbolizes sin uh the priests prefigure the priesthood priesthood of christ and his redeemed people priest is required to be holy in the area of matrimony he is to marry a woman of high moral character she may not be a prostitute because that is a defiling profession he is not al he is also not to marry one who has been divorced the text does not explain this latter prohibition perhaps it acknowledges that even though divorce is allowed by the laws not really uh, remarrying isn't that's a different uh Anyways, I can get into all that right now. Uh, do, do, do. I was curious the element of falling short of the creation ideal uh, and the priests are to embody the covenant ideal in their lives as well as their teaching. Anyways, I think the first part of that text was more helpful. Um, that note, particularly. Okay, well, feel free to pause and grab any of those notes, but I'm not going to give you all the notes from this chapter because let's move on because um, you have these notes. All right, so Leviticus 22. 22. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, so that they abstain from the holy things of the people of Israel, which they dedicate to me, so that they do not profane my holy name. I am the Lord. Say to them, If any one of all your offspring throughout your generations approaches the holy things that the people of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he has an uncleanness, that person shall be cut off from my presence. I am the Lord. None of the offspring of Aaron who has a leprous disease or a discharge may eat of the holy things until he is clean. Whoever touches anything that is unclean through contact with the dead or a man who has had an emission of semen and whoever touches a swarming thing by which he may be made unclean, or a person from whom he may take uncleanness, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who touches such a thing shall be unclean until the evening, and shall not eat of the holy things unless he has bathed his body in water. When the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterward he may eat of the holy things, because they are his food. He shall not eat what dies of itself or is torn by beasts, and so make himself unclean by it. I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my charge, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby when they profane it. I am the Lord who sanctifies them. A lay person shall not eat of a holy thing. No foreign guest of the priest or hired servant shall eat of a holy thing. But if a priest buys a slave as his property from money, the slave may eat of it, and anyone born in his house may eat of his food. If a priest's daughter marries a layman, she shall not eat of the contribution of the holy things. But if a priest's daughter is widowed or divorced and has no child, and returns to her father's house, as in her youth, she may eat of her father's food, yet no layperson shall eat of it. And if anyone eats of a holy thing unintentionally, he shall add the fifth of its value to it, and give the holy thing to the priest. They shall not profane the holy things of the people of Israel, which they contribute to the Lord, and so cause them to bear iniquity and guilt by eating their holy things. For I am the Lord who sanctifies them. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons and all the people of Israel, and say to them, When any one of the house of Israel or of the sojourners in Israel presents a burnt offering as his offering for any of their vows or free will offerings that they offer to the Lord, if it is to be accepted for you, it shall be a male without blemish. Of the bulls or the sheep or the goats, you shall not offer anything that has a blemish, for it will not be acceptable for you. 
And when anyone offers a sacrifice of peace offerings to the Lord to fulfill a vow or as a free will offering from the herd or from the flock, to be accepted, it must be perfect. There shall be no blemish in it. Animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. You may present a bull or a lamb that has a part too long or too short for a free will offering, but for a vow offering, it cannot be accepted. Any animal that has its testicles bruised or crushed or torn or cut, you shall not offer to the Lord. You shall not do it within your land. Neither shall you offer as the bread of your God any such animals gotten from a foreigner since there is a blemish in them. Because of their mutilation, they will not be accepted for you. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, When an ox or sheep or goat is born, it shall remain seven days with its mother, and from the eighth day on it shall be acceptable as a food offering to the Lord. But you shall not kill an ox or a sheep and her young in one day. And when you sacrifice a sacrifice of thanksgiving to the Lord, you shall sacrifice it so that you may be accepted. It shall be eaten on the same day. You shall leave none of it until morning. I am the Lord, so you shall keep my commandments and do them. I am the Lord, and you shall not profane my holy name that I may be sanctified among the people of Israel. I am the Lord who sanctifies you, who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. Leviticus. Okay, before we read Leviticus 23, I just, I just always, I always like how, like, so many times, like, the Lord says, like, I am the Lord, I am the Lord, I am the Lord. Like, do these things, I am the Lord. It's like, I don't know, just like, we should do them because he's the Lord. <laughs> but yeah, we desperately need the Lord's help to do what the Lord has asked us. And we see that exposed through the the Israelites fail to obey the Lord constantly. Um, but yeah, we need, we need God. We needed, we needed a new heart. Um, Ezekiel 36 and Jeremiah 31. Um, we need, we need to be born again. We need Christ. Um, we need the Holy Spirit. But yeah, I also really like this line um, where the Lord says, he says, I am the Lord who sanctifies you who brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord. I just always love when the like God says, like, and I will be your God and you will be my people. It's like, amen. <laughs> uh, I love God so much. But yeah, this, all, this right here, I, I highlighted this because it's foreshadowing how Christ, Christ is going to be the perfect Lamb of God to die in our place. There is no blemish in him. He is perfect. Um, and so in order for like someone to die on our behalf, he had to be perfect. He had to be fully God, fully man. Jesus Christ is the only one who can save us and who could save us because he is perfect. He's never sinned. Someone who is sinful cannot atone on behalf of someone else who needs atonement. Only God, only a perfect only one who is perfect and without sin could die on behalf of one who is sinful. Um, so Jesus Christ, the righteous one, the holy one, he dies on our behalf so that we could be reconciled back to God. What good news that is. Um, thank you, Jesus. So yeah, here's the notes for this passage. Um, let's see, what should we read out loud? Um, for any, un so 22 verse 3, um, the note for that is, um, the note for that says, for any, uh, un for any unclean person to eat holy food from a sacrifice is to risk death. Uncleanness, death, and holiness, life, are not to mix. Mm -hmm. This is why we need to be covered in the righteousness of Christ, the holiness of, of God. Um, one reason. So 22, 10 through 13. These verses define which dependents of the priests are allowed to eat sacrificial food. Okay. 
penalty of restitution is described is prescribed for non priests who eat li- eat the priestly portions of sacrifices. Only blemish free animals are to be sacrificed. This is partly because God is not to be given anything but the best. Malachi one eight says, "When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor?" Or show you favor, says the Lord of hosts. And partly because the holiness of sacrifices is symbolized by a perfect physical body. And ultimately it pointed to Christ dying for us also. And Christ had to be perfect because God is holy. Um... The free will offering is optional and not strictly mandated by God, therefore minor blemishes may be tolerated. Um, Killing an animal soon after birth shows little respect for life and therefore is incompatible with holiness. That's so based. Anyways, um, in other words, I like that that's a thing. Anyways, uh, so it says, so too does killing an animal and its young on the same day show disrespect for life and holiness. God is so amazing, guys. All right, let's read um, 23. Leviticus 23. Um, it is, it's pretty late, so I'm going to up the speed a little bit on what we're listening to. So I'm going to put it to this. You know what? No, because I want to be able to comprehend what I'm reading. And who cares if it's late? This is the word of the Lord, so. Leviticus 23. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, These are the appointed feasts of the Lord that you shall proclaim as holy convocations. They are my appointed feasts. Six days shall work be done, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, a holy convocation. You shall do no work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwelling places. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, the holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. But you shall present a food offering to the Lord for seven days. On the seventh day is a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And on the day when you wave the sheaf, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old, without blemish, as a burnt offering to the Lord. And the grain offering with it shall be two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, a food offering to the Lord with a pleasing aroma, and the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hen. And you shall eat neither bread nor grain, parched or fresh, until this same day, until you have brought the offering of your God. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. You shall count seven full weeks from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering. You shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall present a grain offering of new grain to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwelling places two loaves of bread to be waved, made of two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven, as first fruits to the Lord. And you shall present with the bread seven lambs, a year old without blemish, and one bull from the herd and two rams. They shall be a burnt offering to the Lord, with their grain offering and their drink offerings, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. And you shall offer one male goat for a sin offering, and two male lambs, a year old, as a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord, with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest, And you shall make proclamation on the same day. You shall hold a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. It is a statute forever in all your dwelling places throughout your generations. And when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge, nor shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. 
you shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first day of the month, you shall observe a day of solemn rest, a memorial proclaimed with blast of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work, and you shall present a food offering to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Now on the tenth day of this seventh month is the Day of Atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord, and you shall not do any work on that very day. For it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves on the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth day of this seventh month, and for seven days is the Feast of Booths to the Lord. On the first day shall be a holy convocation. You shall not do any ordinary work. For seven days you shall present food offerings to the Lord. On the eighth day you shall hold a holy convocation and present a food offering to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly. You shall not do any ordinary work. These are the appointed feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim as times of holy convocation for presenting to the Lord food offerings, burnt offerings and grain offerings, sacrifices and drink offerings, each on its proper day besides the Lord's Sabbath, and besides your gifts, and besides all your vow offerings, and besides all your free will offerings, which you give to the Lord. On the fifteenth day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. On the first day shall be a solemn rest, and on the eighth day shall be a solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees, and boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. Thus Moses declared to the people of Israel, the appointed feasts of the Lord. Leviticus 20. All right, well, um, let's read the notes. So it says, attention turns to the calendar of holy days with specific instructions for the laity. Um, numbers 28 and 29, where instructions are given to the priests specifying sacrifices on the different days. And it says, see Exodus 12 and 13 in reference to the Passover. Um, see 16, 12. And do, 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 do. let's look at the notes from the ESV study Bible one more time. So, ooh, what's this chart? Ah, okay, yeah, this is the notes. The Lord, it's the basis for all falling feasts today. There's also holy convocation, Sunday of worship. Sabbath principle permeates each of these feasts, which are intended to express the divine human relationship. Each feast requires one cessation from ordinary work and two dedication to the Lord by means of offerings. Creation. Ah, this is really cool. What the heck? Um, Sabbath feast. Significance creation. Um, Passover, uh, significance, salvation. Yes, it points us to, cr to the Christ, um, first fruits, 
dedication weeks dedication so dedicating to Christ being dedicated to God trumpets solemn assembly spiritual preparation day of atonement uh day of atonement redemption booths joyful remembrance of the lord's historic guidance i like this chart this is a cool chart yeah Um, but yeah. Welp, well, that's it for Leviticus today. That was interesting chapters. Um, thanks be to God for his word. Let's read Mark 1. So let's read our introduction um, to Mark here. Introduction. The Gospel of Mark emphasizes that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the Messiah. Jesus announced the kingdom of God, healed the sick, and died as a ransom for sinners. In addition to Jesus, Mark features three main groups of people, the disciples, the crowds, and the religious leaders, none of whom understood Jesus. When the time came for Jesus to go to the cross, the religious leaders arrested him. The disciples abandoned him, and the crowds jeered him. Only when he died alone on the cross did a Roman centurion rec recognize that he was the Son of God. Though the book is anonymous, the tr tradition identifies John Mark uh, as the author and uh, gives us Acts 12.12. 12. He may have based his gospel on Peter's preaching, writing sometime in the 50s or 60s AD, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Okay, um, well, let's look at our study Bible notes. So, um, feel free to pause and read all of these notes if you want to. They're all very good. This is a good introduction to the passage. Um, so feel free to pause and read all of that. Pause and read that. Pause and read. 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 But yeah, um, let's read part part of this paragraph. It says so. Christ in Mark. Two titles, Christ and Son of God, appear in the opening line of Mark's gospel, showing that announcing the true identity of Jesus is high on Mark's agenda for putting the good news in writing. Jesus is identified as God's Son by the Father's voice from heaven at his baptism, uh, one eleven, and transfiguration, 9-7, by demons, 3-11 and 5-7, and climactically by a Roman centurion at his crucifixion. 1539. His deity is demonstrated by his authority to forgive sins, 2, 5 through 11, and to still the stormy sea, 439. Jesus typically refers to himself as the Son of Man and repeatedly calls attention to the origin of his title in, Daniel vision, in Daniel's vision of a glorious representative, representative of God's suffering people who ascends in, the cl in clouds to receive from God an eternal kingdom. Then it gives us these texts. 
Furthermore, Jesus cites Psalm 110, observing that David's son is also David's Lord. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. Mark also demonstrates Jesus' true humanity and emphasizes the Son of Man's purpose in entering our history is to serve and to suffer, ultimately giving his life as a ransom for many. Amen. The God-man. Jesus Christ. Righteous one. All right, well, let's read. So we are only reading one uh, verses 1 to verse 28 today. So let's pop over to Mark. So open your Bibles to Mark and uh, yeah. Mark. Oh my goodness, it's snowing outside. Ah. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> okay, good. We're on the right speed here. Mark 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven. You are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. The Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness, and he was in the wilderness forty days being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals, and the angels were ministering to him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boat mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, what have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. And immediately he left. All right, well, that's all the text for today. Shall we look at our notes for chapter one?
if you want the notes on this part, feel free to grab this note. So we'll pause and read. Then pause and read. I'm going to read this part of the note, though. It says, the term Christ means anointed one. Jesus was anointed by the Holy Spirit at his baptism and began to fulfill the role of Messiah as described by Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. Interesting. In a sense, this was Jesus' ordination. Well, he was already the Christ, though, so I don't know. Well, interesting. <laughs> Yeah, Jesus willingly submitted to John's baptism, even insisting upon it. Again, John's John protests because he against John's protest because he in so Jesus willingly submitted to John's baptism, even insisting upon it because in his role as Messiah, it was necessary for Jesus to submit to every requirement of God's law for Israel. His identification with his people, Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, um, here's the notes from chapter one. So all the way to, let's see, we went until 28. So yeah. Um, Gospel, a term from political or personal reporting with correspondence, meaning good news. The Greeks used this word for such events as the birth of an emperor or a major military victory of Jesus Christ. This phrase can be understood as about Jesus Christ or from Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Jesus, but it is also from him. Amen. The Gospel of Mark claims divine authority and offers itself as the revelation of Christ through his apostles to the church. Amen. Yes, all scripture inspired by God, breathed out by God. Um, son of God. Mark presents Jesus at the beginning of the Gospel as the divine eternal Son. Okay. Okay, well, feel free to read that first note and then feel free to read these notes. Mark is concerned throughout his gospel with the second Exodus prophesied by Isaiah 40 um, through 54. Yeah. A uh, voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. His mouth the Lord has spoken. Yeah. That's so cool. Prepare your way. Yeah. That is really cool. I like that note. Um. Um, but yeah, feel free to pause and read those notes as well. Holy Spirit, the new covenant brings renewal to the people of God through the Son and the Holy Spirit, whom the Son possesses in full measure 
the son fulfills this role by pouring out the spirit on the day of pentecost acts one um, and two in those days feel free to pause and read that note and that note immediately this important word sometimes translated straight way is characteristic of mark it appears 12 times in the rest of the new testament but 42 times in mark its primary emphasis is not on speed but rather on but rather the sureness and in in inevitability of god's sovereign plan recalling the straight same root root as straight way paths divinely prepared for Jesus's coming in ministry. Mm. That is really cool note. I like that. Wow. Mm. Sorry, I'm just like comprehending it right now. <laughs> Um, feel free to read this note. I'm going to read uh, part of it. It says, In Jesus' baptism, as later in Christian baptism, Matt 28, Matthew 28, 19, all three persons of the Trinity are involved. The initiative of the Father, the vicarious work of the Son, and the glorifying, enabling power of the Spirit are revealed in this act. Amen. Okay. You are my beloved son. The mystery of the person of Jesus finds expression in the divine declaration. He, the second person of the Godhead, is at the same time the one true and faithful Israel, the Israel who pleases the Father, and whom the Father personally and officially acknowledges as son. And this is a prophecy being fulfilled as well, which is so awesome. Um... Yeah. Just prophecy after prophecy after prophecy. Jesus is amazing. It's led by the Spirit in the pillar of the fire along the palace of wilderness text. Um it's a good note, feel free to read that. Um, feel free to read. Um, 40 days. Possibly a symbolic reference to the 40 years of Israel's wilderness experience. Or Moses' 40-day fast on Mount Sinai. Wow. So interesting. So cool. Yeah, so this is from Exodus 34, 28. Um, so he, he was there with the with the lord 40 days and 40 nights he neither ate bread nor drank water and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant the ten commandments wow um do -do -do -do. jesus the second adam begins his defeat of the devil and his work of redemption by passing the, f the test of fil filial obedience in a hostile and corrupted environment Feel free to read more of that note. Um, Jesus, oh wait, I'm actually going to read this part. Jesus enters this domain and binds the strong man. So see the note on this. Actually, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna back up and read the whole note. This is a good note. Uh, this detail emphasizes that the wilderness is a place of curse where the devil is master. Jesus enters this domain and binds the strong man. This scene recalls the testing of Adam. Although Adam was in a garden and not threatened by wild beasts, he fell into Satan's tempting. 
In the wilderness, Jesus, the second Adam, begins his defeat of the devil and his work of redemption by passing the test of fil filial obedience in, in a hostile and corrupted environment. So true, so true. Angels were ministering. Angels accompanied Israel in the Exodus. And it gives us all the places where that is. Or some examples. Um, Jesus Jesus's experience in the wilderness is a type of the Christian's experience in this world. Hebrews 3, come 4. Which is experienced as Satan's domain. Ephesians 6, 12. See note on 1030. The phrase this time with its counterpart, the age to come, reflects the teaching of the rabbis about the two-tiered present evil age and the future age of the Messiah. The resurrection of Jesus significantly alters that view. In the period between the resurrection of Jesus and that of all believers, the two ages exist in overlap. The old is passing away and the new is present, but not in its fullness. Hence, there can be both a hundredfold blessing and, and persecution. Through God's providence, the Spirit's presence, and the, and the global church as the family of God, disciples' needs are met in the present age so that in Christ they could be content in every situation, whether in abundance or in need. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. Oh, that's a good note. Um, feel free to pause and read this section. Time has fulfilled the past times, especially of God's acts of salvation for his people. Israel reached their climax in this present time of salvation through Jesus. Feel free to read this note. Looks like a great note. And this one. Uh, follow me. Fishers of men. Mark immediately shows Jesus choosing disciples to follow him and to call others to him. The first appointed ministry of the nascent church has its primary goal, seeking the lost. This emphasis on evangelism was not lost on the Apostle Paul, who said, Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. Amen! I love that note. I'm obsessed with this note. Because it's based on scripture. That's so important, you guys. So important. Evangelism isn't just something that some people in the church do it's something that we all need to do if you are in christ how dare you not go and preach the gospel to the lost if you've tasted and seen the goodness of the lord how do, how can you not share that with other people it doesn't necessarily mean you need to be billy graham but share the gospel that's like your one reason for still living like <laughs> We are beggars, and we're called to share to point other beggars to the bread. Just do it. Just point. And if if you if you are uncomfortable with evangelism, that's okay. All of us are. <laughs> um, but yeah, I would recommend. I would point you to um, a ministry that's helped me deeply in terms of evangelism is just watching videos. And just being blessed by the content of From Living Waters. He goes out and ministers to people on the street. And he also makes videos to help like Christians um, who are nervous about evangelism and stuff like that. And then, um, yeah, just send me a comment and or whatever. I would love to chat with you about it and like help you because I know that it's hard. I know. Like I'm being harsh, but it's because like I'm harsh on myself because I know that I... I don't want to give into self-preservation. I want to serve the Lord. Um, I want to fight against um, my just my weakness, and I want to find strength in the Lord, courage in the Lord, to do what He's called us to do, which is to to share the gospel as we go, and to go out and share the gospel. Um, and we can do it together, you guys. Um, if you live near me, like, I would love to go do evangelism together. You know, we can do street evangelism or just, you know, just encourage one another in evangelizing to people at our jobs or whatever it may be. Um, yeah, share the gospel <laughs> to your family members, to, you know, 
and it's such a joy to like to share it and it's like it is the power of god for salvation it's the means that god uses to bring people to himself in his timing and so trusting in him as we do share it um but yeah pause and read um pause and read up to here um Jesus' mission is to destroy the works of the devil. 1 John 3, 8. Yep, 1 John 3, 8. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And his exor- um, Jesus' mission is to destroy the works of the devil, and his exorcisms of demons from victims whom they have possessed and tormented is the beginning of God's royal re- royal conquest to vanquish the forces of evil and death amen holy one of god jesus is described this way only in this incident the demons quake in the presence of divine holiness um yeah ha what do you, have you come to show i know who you are the holy one of god Jesus is the Holy One of God, the Holy One of Israel, as other books of the Bible um, describe him. Uh, Be silent. This term emphasizes Jesus' power to establish his kingdom in the face of evil. With the same term, which can also be rendered, be muzzled, he will silence the stormy sea. Okay, well... Um, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's it for today. So let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, oh God, for allowing us to read together. Lord, um, would you cause us to be obedient to this text? Would you show us through your spirit how you want us to respond to this text, Lord? Um, and just, I pray that the things that we learned about you today would just drive us in love for you, Lord, um, and of you, that we would, um, cherish your words in our heart, that we would store up your words in our hearts so that we would not sin against you. And you would just teach us your ways. Um, thank you for, um, just how amazing you are, Lord, and, um, for what you've done in Christ Um, to bring us to yourself, Lord. And, uh, oh God, would you just uh, be with us as we go out from here? Please help us to meditate on the things that we've read and heard. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, grace and peace. Um, See you tomorrow, Lord willing. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.